You want to do it again? <laughs> I'd like to call to order the uh, St. Lena Shape Committee uh, meeting of December 6th. And uh, I would like to go ahead and call roll. It's easier that way. So, Chair Smithers? Here. Vice Chair Chateau? Here. Committee Member Barr? Caldwell? Here. Dell? Here. Dell? Here. Feeney? Knight? Here. Two. Neiman? Park? Here. Sylvester? Here. Smith? Here. Okay. Um, I'd like to open it up for any um, public comment, if there is any. Appears there probably isn't. So we'll go ahead and close public comment and get on with the uh, the consent item 4.1 to approve the uh, the minutes of the November 29th meeting. We have a motion. I move to uh, approve the minutes of the November 29th meeting. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. opposed. Okay. Um, on to new business. We've got, I think, Jean's going to sort of walk us through the community engagement and communications update and what we've been doing so far and what we're going to do. Just launch in. So as Mark introduced, we have Jean Holden here with us this evening. She'll be um, explaining our community engagement strategy as we move forward and discussing with you um, brainstorming ideas for how to get the community involved um, as far as focus groups and outreach. Thank you. Uh, and I'm here with Roseanne Lopez, who is a team member of ours. Um, uh, seven, eight months ago, I worked with the interim city manager on a contract to do public engagement and relationship building and community connections between the city council members, council and staff, and public engagement. And this was uh, really promoted and at the idea of two of the council members. The same two council members who came up with the SHAPE Committee. And this is the, an ongoing process of public engagement. And so they asked if I would participate with this committee to do the public engagement part. So the whole point and the idea is to really press the reset button in the city of St. Helena to help folks really understand that the council, the planning commission, want public engagement to be a part of the life and the challenges and the decisions that are being made with St. Helena. So as part of this process, this is public engagement, obviously, and thank you for all the time and effort you have and will be spending on this. But then the idea was that at a parallel track, at times we would be working with the city manager and Allison to help get community uh, engagement in this broader than this group. So what we're talking about is a couple of different open to the public meetings and then some focus groups. The focus groups will kick in a little bit more when you're at the place of having some recommendations. The open to the public groups and one is is uh, on the timeline right now for January, there will probably be another one in March or April. The idea is to invite the public to talk about what they're seeing. Some of people have been at every one of your meetings. Some people have taken the tours of the facilities. Some people are reading the materials online. But to invite the public to say, what, what are you seeing? What's happening? to ask them some open-ended questions. You know, as you look at the facilities, as you read these reports, what are questions that you might have? What are concerns that you might have? What are, what are exciting challenges or opportunities that you might see? So it would be very, very open-ended uh, in the informational and broad public meetings. The focus groups would have much more 
there will be some open-ended questions, but much more defined. Looking at the recommendations that you're making. You know, what do you see that challenges you or that causes you concern as you look at these recommendations? Is there something missing? So that there is a parallel track to the work that you're doing. And part of the reason for this is that the city has a history of getting groups like yours involved who work very, very hard to come up with recommendations. And then they go to the city council or the planning commission and there are split votes or it's, oh my gosh, there's so much public outcry, we're not going to move on this. We don't want to set you up for that. We want to try and do as much open engagement as we possibly can in a parallel track that doesn't throw you off um, at any point in the process, but also doesn't sabotage you when it gets to the end. Does that make sense? That was the assumption. So good, good. Can I make a comment? Just Please. Well, when, this afternoon when I was going through this again for the second time because I was part of this committee eight years ago, and this is exactly what we did, and this is exactly it here. So we're doing it all over again eight years later, and now it's kind of, it's, um, I know things have to be changed because we can't do what was on that visioning at this point because eight years have gone by. But is is it you know I'm just hoping that it's not going to take another eight years to f finish and do it over again. Mm -hmm. I mean we're doing that, the exact same thing that we did eight years ago. Just Can I address that just a little bit, Suzanne? Yes. That was just about Adam Street. Right. So right, what we're doing right. is all the facilities that are owned exactly, by exactly, exactly. And, and I and I it also suggests that we don't know if Adam Street can be done according right. to the vision statement, or Adam and Street can be done according to anything. I'm sorry, I should have. know the. Finances. I should have said I'm just talking about this tonight. Yeah. But this Adam Street thing. Okay. We have done that eight years ago. Okay. So that's all, all I right. wanted to say. So. I'm guessing that a number of you have seen projects like this, challenges. We were just with the Planning Commission and listening to the challenges around the general plan and zoning. The city has a history, maybe even a culture, of the community engaging, maybe even second-guessing, possibly blocking some of the decisions and the ways that the elected officials and groups like this want to move forward. So we know that. We know that ahead of time. We don't actually, we don't want to stop people from really engaging. We want to encourage that. I mean really encourage that as early in the process as often as we possibly can. Because what happens is people will say, and they're going to say it anyways, but they will say, we never had the opportunity to be heard. We never had the opportunity, or, or I spoke, but you didn't listen to me. Now, sometimes you didn't listen to me means you didn't agree with me, but sometimes it means that somehow groups like this communicated that they didn't care. And that's part of what we want to break with the open public engagements and the focus groups. So part of what we would like to engage with you right now is a brainstorming on who, who needs to be a part. If we were going to do some outreach, who are the groups, places, organizations, demographics, if we really wanted whether it's in the open to the public groups or in the focus groups. And let's just start with the open to the public groups. If we were going to advertise this, if we were trying to get as big a cross-section of the city as possible, give us some ideas of where we should go. I would say that you should probably start with all the nonprofit um, uh, community uh, uh, people, um, they're the ones that do all the volunteer work for 
the Rotary, the Kiwanis, the um, junior women, the federated women, the um, Seroptimist. Uh, I mean, they're the ones that volunteer all the hours that, that uh, in the community, and they know um, where help is needed, and they have great ideas. Historical Society go to the, to the uh, school board. The school board, or or yeah, I guess that's that's the right way. But s somehow to get young parents involved, and then at the opposite end, you should probably work with um, Julie Spencer at the senior center and get that into the demographic. I was thinking the Chamber of Commerce to get people that might not that might in the professional world that might not have time for volunteering. Um, also, Odd Fellows is a very strong group of men in town that have a nonprofit, and it's a younger demographic as well. It's very robust. Mm -hmm. I get yeah. For me, the most important thing is going to, however you do get there, is that we do have a representative demographics of town because we do have some more vocal groups than other groups that are less vocal um, and that's where <clears throat> certainly we can end up in trouble if we're only hearing from certain groups so how, however the community engagement and outreach works we, we have to be uh, looking at the folks that are showing up and making sure we do have a cross section and so I, I you know I, I, I what everybody has said as far as various groups to get the word out I you know hopefully we can get the word out too through the newspaper and yeah through I think you know maybe even go to the principals of every school district because the district you know or of the school because maybe the school district offices and the board school board may not get that word out because I don't know how well attended those are if they're as similarly attended as this meeting is um, people may not hear the information but the principals at each of the various schools may be able to get the word out because um, I do believe there's a lot of, you know, the, the young folks in town with the families, I mean, I, you know, with, you know, most of the help of my wife, I mean, we raised two kids, and you're just busy. I mean, and you're busy on Saturdays, and you're busy on Sundays. I mean, so whenever those meetings are, too, is important to not have, I, I remember some town hall meetings we had in the past, and, you know, they were, you know, during soccer season on Saturday mornings. Well, you know, there were... 300 kids playing soccer on Saturday morning and so all the parents and the the friends and family of those kids never came to the town hall meeting so you, you we do have to you know <clears throat> make sure I think you know you probably need to sit down and really pencil it out and you know and then I, I don't know how you you know as far as the focus groups go I guess the focus groups depending on how many you want to do they could be targeted I mean you could have a focus group with the Chamber of Commerce and a focus group you know um, at, at Vineyard Valley and a, and a fo I mean you could have various focus groups that would be each one of those would be focused on a part of the demographics of town um, and then you can sort of coalesce all that information Hi I'm Stan Knight thank you uh, just to throw out a communications idea another channel which you're probably all aware of it's called um, myneighborhood.com and uh, it's a it's a forum but it's zoned down into small neighborhoods or subsections of the city I don't know if you've encountered um, you know where the holes in the communications may be or have been in the past where people missed hearing about these things and then showed up to comment at the last minute but just to throw that out my neighborhood um, is a way to put a a bullet in there that something is taking place um, I, I think it's fantastic what we're talking about here and this was my biggest concern in the very beginning of this group being put together I was worried that we we're going to spend a lot of time on this and finally come to a consensus of which what we want to do and then there's this huge sales job to the community and there wasn't enough time to speak to everybody. I remember uh, being involved in a project a couple of years ago where, you know, pretty much had to get consensus on the community. 
And I remember talking to Deborah Harlan and saying, how, how, how am I going to make this work? How can I promulgate these ideas and get consensus? And she said to me, you have to take everybody to lunch one at a time. You need an hour. And I looked at her like, oh my God, this, how many people are there? 5,000 people, 5,000 lunches. And I always look back on that comment and I realize how true that is because these issues are so complex. You need a good, solid hour to corner one person. And, uh, you know, you've got to take the cell phone away. You've got to get them focused and go one by one down the, down the items. Where we are financially, what are the long-term goals, what are the assets, what's falling apart, what has to be done, how do you fix the roads, how do you deal with the traffic, housing, blah, 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 blah. Very complex. And so when you start to work in groups, it gets even more difficult. So where am I going with this? What I'm going is I learned my lesson in talking to community groups. Disaster. You have to find the key players in each community group. Because what happens is everybody looks to the, the top dog. Like, which way are we going? Because what I didn't realize with talking to community groups is they're all there out of a volunteer spirit because they like each other, they have a friendship, it's a camaraderie, and they don't want to ruffle feathers if something is irritating somebody, especially one of the top leaders. So if the top leaders is not buying into it, all the rank and file won't make a motion because they don't want to upset that top leader. So these were dynamics that I never realized until I got involved politically here a couple of years ago. And now I understand better because every group is kind of led by a couple of key people who kind of guide the way and everybody kind of follows along. That's, the, that's how our country works, you know. And so if you don't identify those key people and get consensus from them, you're never going to get the rank and file to follow along. And all of a sudden you realize you're going to get no endorsement from any of these groups because they're all going to self-destruct, not self-destruct, but they're going to like, they, they don't know what to do. You know, because anything you do might create conflict because we have this tremendous nin, NIMBY mentality in this, in this town where if you go to one, one committee and they realize, oh, somebody lives over there in that community and it might affect their street extension or it might ex uh, affect the traffic or the housing, they're going to say no. And then the rest of the group goes, geez, I'd rather have just coffee and donuts and go to my meetings and not have this person mad at me. So I, I'm not going to say anything. So you might get private consensus one-on-one, -on -one, but you're not going to get a group's consensus. So you have to kind of figure out how to make that work. So if you're going to talk to the... Um, to the library board, you're going to talk to around the house, whatever, you got to understand those dynamics and you better walk away with some deal because otherwise you just, it's just hot air. You're not going to get any traction because what happens is you can get those groups signed on to something. Then they'll start to talk virally and then you can get, you can get the benefits from, benefits from that. But again, you got to figure out who is running the show. Thanks. I'd like to extend those comments. Um, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I participate in a uh, um, Thursday morning coffee thing over at Rianda House, and, and there are about 15 old guys that, uh, that get together and talk. Uh, and they have been very interested. They know I'm on this committee, and they always ask about it. We always end up with maybe 20 minutes of our hour gets devoted to this particular subject. Uh, so I, I have a, a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, I agree with, uh, with the idea of communicating with all of the service organizations and every group we can think of. I think it would be a terrific idea if you had a, you know, a little 10-minute slideshow on what it is we're doing. You know, what are we trying to do? And uh, the second thing would be to put members of this committee out in front of the public. Uh, if, if we're just uh, 11 people and, and nobody knows who we are and we're cooking something in the back room, uh, I don't think that will be nearly as effective as if we are out as part of the communication process. Uh, I'd be perfectly happy to, you know, a 10-minute slideshow is nothing and uh, just says who we are and what we're doing. And um, uh, I think that would be an effective way to get understanding in the community and get a dialogue started. 
Uh, and from there, I mean, like with our Loranda House group, there are people that are absolutely convinced that the only solution is the, uh, is the hotel. And there are others who want to walk their dogs and breathe the fresh air. And so uh, uh, it's interesting to hear them start to talk to each other about those issues. Not that I'm suggesting what a solution ought to be. I just tell them what we have discussed as a committee. Uh, uh, so far. And so, uh, anyway, those are my thoughts, and I just want to add them to the discussion. I do think there is a lot of, um, <clears throat> for lack of a better term, um, fake news out there. <laughs> that, And I think that's one thing, hopefully, the committee will sort of dispel or some of the rumors that exist, um, and we will get the facts out there. And, and hopefully the, the paper will help us with that. And, and hopefully in your open to the public meetings and in the focus group meetings, whoever those are with and whoever attends them, that we will get the facts out there. Um, because right now there are a lot of preconceived ideas about a lot of things in town. And I, I think that's, we're, we're right now building this base of information and we are trying to get the base of information out there. So there hasn't been a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, meat on the bone yet with the meeting. We're, we're sort of getting started here, but I think come January, we're going to start getting information on all the buildings. That's going to get out to the public. We're going to start getting financial information and long-term plans. And so, and hopefully then things will start to, you know, come together and we'll have some, you know, some, some other consultants that will help us identify these things. And then we'll get some information from what the public's talking about. So I, it is a bit of a process that we have to make sure we go through. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I agree that you need to talk to the guys or the gals that are, you know, quote unquote, the leaders of the groups. But there's, there's also a lot of non-group people also. They have, they're, they're not official groups, but they have their own groups. So that's why I, I think maybe, uh, you know, going through the school district at some level or another is helpful. And maybe, even, you know, and if the newspaper's covering things, hopefully that'll help and, and people do talk. You know, maybe something else as far as when these meetings are to occur, if we can, you know, get those out. Maybe you gotta put flyers and posters up all around town. You know, when there's events happening in town, you know, people find out about it through flyers and posters that are on Gilwoods and over at, you know, the bicycle shop and at the back door of Steve's Hardware. And, I mean, that's where they see all these things. So once we have meeting dates and what it's all about, maybe that's another way of trying to get that information out there as well. Gene, could you explain the focus groups a little better? I'm not sure that I understand... Um Who's going to form them, where they're going to be, and what they're going to do? Do you want to start that? Uh, Mark Prestwich, City Manager. So with the focus groups, these are groups that we're anticipating to be between nine and a dozen people. And uh, whether it's looking at a specific demographic or a cross-section, which can be randomly sampled and assemb assembled to essentially represent a cross-section of the community, there's an opportunity to talk to them about brainstorming ideas. There are opportunities to do more of a rapid-fire questions on, questions on a variety of subjects that either the staff or the committee has an interest in receiving feedback on. Um, this is a fluid process, and so tonight's an opportunity to really seek uh, feedback from you as well. I think we have some thoughts on how these unfold, uh, but we're very open to adjusting. And uh, with respect to focus groups, it, the end, what, what I'm anticipating is that by reaching out to different demographics, the feedback, some of those ideas that you shared, if we, if we looked at those different demographics, and ask the same question among each of those groups, we can produce a matrix for you of the feedback that we've received on those various questions that might help inform you as to what the community demographics think about these same questions, uh, but from different perspectives. So we're anticipating that it could be very helpful to guide the discussions that you will confront down the road. I hope that's helpful. 
will we be part of that those focus groups no we're anticipating that this is really a separate track this is the public engagement track if you remember that calendar we have on the left column the needs assessment that's the work that the consultant EMG is producing in the middle is the shape committee the work that you're uh, producing you will be confronting the challenge of figuring out the the puzzle pieces here and again no right answer necessarily um, and then the final column to the right is public engagement and we're anticipating that these things are happening concurrently but we see an opportunity for the committee to test if you want um, various issues or if you have questions that you want answered by a variety of perspectives within the community the focus groups and the workshops can be designed in a way to provide you feedback back to the committee we, so what we would anticipate doing is providing you a report uh, at some points following those exercises so who will conduct those groups is that going to be Jean? the staff would work with Jean mm -hmm. I have an idea I was thinking that um, it might be good to do invites like if each committee member came up with 10 people and sent a personal invite if we sat down and were strategic about that list and all the different organizations that we knew and who represented what segment it might be an effective way of actually getting people there like if I were to take it on to get 10 people that represented you know one from a church one from a school one from a private school one from public school um, I just one idea I was sitting here thinking since we all probably have a lot of different contacts with different groups I was thinking on that very same line because I think that's probably the only way you're gonna get anyone to participate because you can publicize all you want and I can't tell you how many people I told that they should come tonight you can see by the audience that they're they're not here so your idea I to me is is great I know a lot of people I could ask and I'm sure you all do that might be interested you've met with many people all over already I'm sure that might want to be part of a focus group so I think I think that's a good idea um, I, I can almost see well th th this is two parts one is the first part that we all come up with something that we all kind of believe in and and come to some consensus I'm going to be curious to see what what that is but the second part is I can almost see like uh, we're a panel in, at the Cameo, and we invite everybody to a party, and uh, hot dogs and popcorn, it's free, and we're at the Cameo down there in the front, and everybody just hammers us with questions, and we try to answer, and maybe we have a visual presentation. I mean, it has to be a little bit more fun than coming here, because this is kind of the pain room. You know, you come here, and your blood pressure goes up. I don't know how many times uh, anybody's been up in that in front of that microphone and you got three minutes, but wow, your head spins. So that's kind of a, I can see the cameo being more fun because people go there for entertainment and it's more lively and there's a little bit more anonymity. You're kind of in the dark, you're in your seat, you're having popcorn and you can throw a tomato at one of us, you know. But I, I'm all for some kind of um, a meeting like that in the cameo. Kathy would support us. I, I appreciate that idea and getting people comfortable in order to ask us questions and talk and those folks that might not. But I think it uh, because it's a public meeting and a committee, I, I think there's certain protocol that has to happen in order to get the minutes for it and get the data and, and, and whatnot. So I think these are things we can all explore as far as trying to communicate and get you know the the the, um, the community to, to engage in the process I think we'll start having more people show up when you start again start talking about things that are a little more substantive when we when we start you know looking at the reports on each of the buildings and and what EMG is saying about each of the buildings I'm hoping people will show up and they will have read you know the information you know that was attached to the agenda before the meeting happens and people will have real comments about you know whether they think you know the teen center what whether they believe EMG's report on it and the value of the property and I mean I think we'll finally start you know it'll 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 I think emotions will start to come out and people will start 
coming and talking. And, and when you start looking at a 20-year financial forecast, I'm pretty sure you have a lot more people engaged in saying, well, what were all the assumptions and how did you get there? And, oh, well, wait, it says, I mean, I, so I, I, I think we'll, I'm, I'm, we'll have to somehow figure out how to get more community involvement there. But then, yes, we will get to a point where we as a group will have our ideas as to what we think we should propose for each of the facilities and you know replacement facilities and all that and that will that will certainly probably be a more lively debate Greg go on up there <coughs> hello my name is Greg Desmond I'm uh, land use consultant and I live in Angwin and I'm here uh, tonight for another uh, topic but uh, public engagement I think you guys are making great progress with this and I just wanted to add a couple other and I, you may already have this but I don't believe you have a dedicated website and or a mailing list that you might be able to utilize to get the uh, message out to folks it's also a, a way that people can um, you, know, you can have uh, it can be a repository of data that you guys have assembled throughout the process and it's another good way for people to get to the information and share it with others easily um, one other point I wanted to mention was during my tenure here at, in St. Helena we um, identified key stakeholders and I think you guys are getting really close to this point that we invited to have um, a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with and those folks at the time were um, key employers here in and business people here in the community and th those conversations the one-on-one -on -one conversations were really really effective in getting um in, in really useful information so th that's my oh the other idea was um direct mailers i mean i know it's print a lot of people say print is dead but a nicely designed um simple mailer can also be very effective and that's it for now Thank you. What's the what's the intent of all of that? You have a it's on. So you have a pile of these in a box at the courtyard. You know, from many of you have said we have committee after committee after committee and nothing ever happens. So is there a certain group of individuals who, after all is said and done, they come out and say, "No, you can't do this." Is it a massive uprising? Is it a few people? Is it, I mean, why? Why are you going through all this effort and having no outcome? I guess I'm not following your question completely because you did sign up for the, for the committee, but um, I, I guess I, I guess I'm going to partly disagree. I, I, I think we're trying, there's a little bit of a paradigm shift and change going in how city government and city council is is working with the with with the community and I guess I'll go back to my most recent engagement and that is with the utility rate committee and I I think that went really well and it operated in the same sort of form and format here and we we did get a lot of participation so and I and, and maybe in the past there were committees and then they would go to city the, the proposals would go to city council and city council sort of would like, oh, okay, that was great, thanks, but now we had the committee and then they do their own thing. I, I really do believe there's, there's a different feel and approach coming from city government and from the city council these days. So I'm very optimistic that what ends up coming out of this is something that a large majority of town is going to appreciate and understand and it's going to go to city council and then hopefully we'll be able to start, you know, acting on it yeah, I'm not speaking from a point of angst that I'm upset that we're here and we might be wasting our time I think Jean you said uh, this happens time and again she said that the city has a history of forming committees and nothing becoming of them and this discussion started with who should we be inviting and I guess what I'm asking is are there a few individuals in town who generally speaking come out of the woodwork when the work is done and try and get things stopped individuals Joshua come out of town come out of the woodwork if whatever the decision is affects them directly sure if if it's a decision about housing and it's close to them 
uh, and they find that housing undesirable, they're going to come out. If the city council makes a decision to give a, um, a contract to a developer to put a hotel on the Adams Street property, and people are unhappy about that, I think there were about 100 people in this room that night. So it depends on, they aren't going to come out if it doesn't affect them. Now, when we discussed utility rates, we actually got quite a few people out to a lot of those meetings because that issue affected everyone. But we also had a grassroots committee that started that whole movement, and we had a very large mailing list, and we sent emails to people every time there was going to be a city council meeting when that subject was going to be on the agenda. So it's not one group. It's a variety of people, and it depends on whether they're affected. And and just to <clears throat> follow up on that, I think we're giving everybody ample opportunity to come talk and, and say their, what they think and what their issues and concerns are. And at the end of the day, it's going to be the committee's responsibility to take the whole body of information <laughs> and look at what is best for the entire town and not focus on a couple of maybe, if I can say, minority opinions. I'm hoping there's a, a generally large consensus on what will come out of this. And it is true. We have had issues in the past, but I, I, I truly believe that the town, the city government and the city council is trying to change the past, and we're operating in a different form and format, and, and we're engaging with people more um, and trying to listen better. So I, I, the past did happen, and I think we're, we're, I, I think we're learning from the past, and so hopefully we won't repeat the past. So there's a couple of other just kind of ideas I have. So, and I think it's, it's along what you were talking about. Um, if you have the names of groups or of individuals that you think, oh my gosh, this person would be great to be invited to an open public meeting and or a focus group, is your process that everything goes through the chair? Would that be okay if they sent that to you and then uh, absolutely. Can, no, we can we, get that? We should get everybody's ideas and, and absolutely send me the emails on every every person or group you think, and then we can put the list together and we can even bring the list back maybe to a meeting and get some confirmation on it. Yeah. I think that would be helpful because part of what we also have is I, I'm not from St. Helena. I've been doing work here for a while. We've got a city manager that's new to the area, I'm not sure how long you've been around, but we've got uh, staff that is relatively new, too. So part of what you have is longevity. And so it's really individuals and or groups that you think should be engaged in this or should be at least invited to be engaged in this. So that, that's one list. The other thing is um, when we... I guess the, the question I would have is, do you have any ideas about what blocks public engagement? What blocks it? Is it that people have to come to this room and they don't want to? Do, do things need to be scattered? Do they need to be at the library? Do they need to be in some other place? Is it place? Is it time? Is it that it's boring and you need to make it more fun? And I, I mean, honestly, I don't know. Is it that truly communication, the way we, the outreach has been done, has not been terribly effective? Is there any input on that? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think that's a great question. And to Josh's point and, and Oliver's and the, the fun factor and also uh, the gap uh, about why things didn't, have good attendance in the past is something important to look at, obviously. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the proactive ch We want the community to be proactive um, and finding the right channels are, you know, is, is really important. And are there some channels that didn't work in the past, to your point? Um, and are there some new ways, uh, you know, website, um, direct mail? Uh, 
a gathering, as Oliver was talking about, something that's fun. Um, but what happened in the, what were some experiences from the past that had a gap where participation wasn't as effective or great as anticipated, and therefore the initiative kind of languished. So taking a look at the gap analysis in communications and adding some new touches to that. But I, and Mark makes a good point too, where you know, the, the, the spirit is moving in the right direction, it seems, to get more enga public engagement. The how is is important, of course. Find some new ways to get the how to happen. Gene, are you looking for a mailing list? I think those would be appreciated, yes. Well, what I was thinking is you've got Napa Vision, and you could probably get a subset from them of their St. Helena addresses. Um, Doug Barr has got a list of 1,200 names or something like that that uh, he uses occasionally. The city has a list already. Um, Pat, I think you have a list. <laughs> So I think that there, you know, if you took the lists that are out there and and uh, cross-reference them, I'll bet you've got eighty percent of the city covered. I had, I was just thinking the things that um, to get people to be engaged is why does it matter to them, and so often you don't know until it's too late. So when I would be communicating to people, I would say we are looking at these facilities. Do you use these facilities and do you care about their use and how they are going to be used in the future if you do show up to this meeting and make sure it's the right time for it to be a good use of their time you know that that meeting this time so give them the motivation for why it matters to them and then also why is it different this time what you just said was very motivating to me and I think that that would be true for other people that might have participated in the past and feel like why would this be any different why is the city different now what are we going to be doing differently I think that why people haven't maybe participated as much in the past or what keeps people from participating is one, I, I think often they don't think they're being listened to anyway. So they say, what's the point? Why should I go? Because they're going to go off and make whatever decision they make. And, you know, we, we used to have a lot of votes in city council, five to zero, every single time for years and years and years. And I, as a citizen, you're out there going, how can nobody be dissenting on it? I mean, so you, it felt like things were happening, you know, outside the meetings, and, and it was predetermined decisions. So I think, I think there's the people didn't think they were being listened to, so we have to make sure people realize that we, and I think you even said it, that, that we care and that we are listening to them. So that's good. We're going to have to keep pounding that out there and let everybody know that. I, I, I think that often, again, because people are busy, they just don't participate if it, if it isn't going to be closely affecting them. So now maybe this is a little bit bigger of an issue because it has so many facilities, and it's also going to touch on the Adam Street facility, which is not quite the third rail, but it's probably the two and a half rail. <laughs> um, so, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get more participation there. And, and at the same time, I think also why sometimes you don't get the participation is if the people are, you know, comfortable with the committee and the committee makeup and, and selection, they, they just, they, they read it in the paper, they maybe watch it online, you know, and then they just, they say they're, they're doing okay. We're, you know, I mean, it's, it, with the utility rate committee, I mean, much to Pat's, you know, credit, they, they did have a group, they got a lot of people out there. But there were also a lot of people, a whole, I mean, large swath of town not showing up. And, but that doesn't, I heard from people all the time during that process, and they were happy with what the committee was doing. So they didn't feel they needed to show up. So I think that's why people don't engage. Those are at least my thoughts. But, you know, last year there was a, a really striking example of people engaging. The city council had, for the first time that I'm ever aware of, the opportunity for people just to come. City council wasn't sitting back here, but they were sitting more like in a half circle here in chairs. People could come and tell the city council what they wanted as their goal for the city. People were really excited. This room was full. 
And people got up and they were so happy that finally somebody was going to listen to them. There was a, a really good example, a woman that lives at Woodbridge, an older woman, and she doesn't get around that well. And she asked if something could be done about putting a sidewalk uh, on the east side of, of, of Hunt because the people from Wood, Woodbridge can't walk down to Safeway safely. She was ignored. She, she was immediately put down, in fact, even in that meeting. And then I went to a Napa Vision 2050 meeting, and she came to that meeting and talked about her need for a sidewalk. I was embarrassed for the city that she had to go to a meeting like that. And then, finally, the city is doing it. There's, there's some action, at least, at least I understand that there is, that some movement is going forward. People finally heard her. She came back to the city council again. And you're right, there's a different city council now. And people did hear her, and hopefully, if it's at all possible, she'll get her sidewalk. But I saw people, it was like the air came out of the balloon. At the beginning of the meeting, they were all excited and to, to be able to express what it was they'd like to see happen. And then they were received with such a a a apathy that like the air all came out of the balloon at the end of the meeting. It was very sad. So I, I think it is important to assure people that their opinions are going to be heard. And if their opinion's not in the majority, it's not necessarily going to be done. But at least their opinion's going to be sought. And they're going to have their opportunity either in a focus group or in a public meeting to express their opinion. I'd like to elaborate on that, Pat. I'm glad you brought that up because I remember that meeting quite well, and it was a full house, and I was up there also. <clears throat> the only thing is um, sometimes I like the British system, which is uh, the open argument and debate, and the Brits aren't, aren't afraid to, to go at it and uh, call each other names and, and uh, rebut each other to death and outwit each other. There seems to be a sort of a sterility in the way we go about it, which is the council or the planning department, they sit up here and everybody gets up there one-on-one -on -one and, and gives, up, gives their grievances for three minutes and then everybody can't comment. And then they sit down and then uh, at the end uh, they end up making a decision, but there's no, there's no room for rebuttal. So I always felt frustrated when I wanted to advocate a point or a case before any committee, uh, government of a committee, that I couldn't get into the rebuttal. So what would happen is I would lay down my cards, they'd look at my cards, and then they would trump me with their last card, and then I couldn't come back for a draw. And so I always felt frustrated because they would come to a conclusion on something that I knew I could rebut and contradict them, uh, but I didn't, I, I didn't have that access. So I would walk away twice as frustrated uh, coming to these meetings. So. What I'm thinking is different would be to be in a situation like at the Cameo where the people would, would, would give the grievances, well, we don't like your idea because it's going to add more traffic. And then we would, we would say, well, this is what we're going to do to alleviate the traffic, or maybe we have to have more traffic because we have to have some impacts to get more glory, to get more benefits. And then that person would be allowed to rebut, and we'd be able to rebut back. And then that would be a real dialogue, a real dialectic that would get to the truth and maybe flesh out that one party's right or wrong. And I'm not afraid of that. And I find that in this system there's a little bit of a kind of a firewall because people are afraid to get into an open dialogue or, or an argument about something. That's why I like the British system because they go at it. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of things come out of it that don't necessarily come out of hiding behind protocol. You're absolutely right, and I I hope that we won't will give people the opportunity to rebut, and I hope it is more of a, a back and forth. And I th and again, I hate to be going back to the utility, <laughs> but I think we had a lot of that. You know, I wasn't the chair of that. I in fact, I wasn't even the assistant. But the but we did have a lot. We let the, we let the public come in, and and we you know we brought them. We even had public up comment at the end and at the beginning, and you know we sort of maybe broke some of the rules of protocol while we were going along. But I'm okay breaking the rules of protocol as long as people feel they're getting the opportunity to speak. And you're right, 
it is. I've, I've had the same frustrations where, you know, I've said something and then they say something. And I'm going, absolutely not. No, you are completely off. Dot. And you want to go talk and they go, no, nope, no, nope, you've already spoken once. You can't do that. We're, we're going to hopefully, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm the chair, so I get to do it. I'm going to let people talk. So, yep. Well, please keep the ideas, the comments coming, and I, I know that if they get to Mark, they'll get through to, to us as we're designing this process. We don't want to close you off at this point in time. We just are aware of the time, and you have another or other items on the agenda. But please let us know if you think of something after you go home or a few weeks into the process. Don't hesitate to let us know. Just one last thought was an email list, since you said that that worked before with the utilities. If there are interested people in getting updates, you already have it. And reminders? Okay. Thank you. So is there anybody in the public who would like to discuss anything with regards to the last topic? And if there isn't, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Uh, I'm taking that as a no. So next on the uh, the agenda is the review of the 2009 Adam Street property vision. And I think what Greg's going to do is really just go through the process of what happened and how we got there. And I don't know that we're here to debate that vision, whether it's right or wrong, or, you know, it, it makes sense now or doesn't. But I think we need to hear what that whole process was and We'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. So it's great to have Greg Desmond back at the, uh, at the mic. It's wonderful to be back. Um, and it's rather strange to be on this side of the, uh, the, uh, the podium here. Um, in any event, yes, uh, I was involved in 2009 with the Adam Street visioning process, and that process was a process that was uh, sort of worked in tandem with the general plan up uh, early stage of the general plan update process and with that process we did engage in quite a bit of um, public outreach in in that process that that outreach um, strategy involved working with state uh, primary stakeholders we identified through the general plan update steering committee a series of stakeholders to contact about the process um, consultants interviewed with those folks uh, and we got feedback from those folks we also had direct mailers that we used to uh, do outreach to the public uh, regarding uh, what we were working on and we also for this specific um, exercise we had two community workshops one was held at the up, up valley campus of the Napa valley college the other was held at the um, this public school on uh, at the corner of um, elementary correct the elementary school that's right and we it was a challenge we did think long and hard about um, how to hold those meetings in a way which would uh, engage as many people as possible we did understand that you know because uh, people have uh, busy schedules that you know there was no way we were ever going to have um, uh, pick a date and a time and, and a forum which would be perfect for everyone but we tried to be uh, really smart about that and we en ended up having quite a bit of um, uh, part we had great participation in, and, and, and provided folks at two these two different occasions these two workshops uh, with the time or, and the opportunity to speak with us um, in addition to in regards to, re regards to community engagement we also had like I said a, a dedicated website we created a mailing list that people could opt into and get receive information about the process and and then we also did direct mailing um, the process the Adam Street process was well, you know this was not the first attempt the city had in identifying a use for the, the parcel so um, in a previous exercise the city had um, um, solicited uh, proposals from a series of folks to do uh, housing projects on the site which were all um, from one reason or another um, turned down and so this when the general plan update process was started the community thought this the, the council at the time thought it would be a good time to also reopen the whole idea of what to do with 
Amstreet. So that's what sort of kicked off the whole process. And over over the, I forget how many months it was. It's been almost a decade since this happened, but it was a series of months where we had lots of uh, committee members, the public workshops, and so forth. We came up with. Uh, three alternatives which were loosely based on uh, land use programs that went from intensive to mostly open space. Um, and in the end, we ended up with the preferred alternative that you see in front of us, which is really a mixture of, of all uses um, being, you know, civic uses, housing, uh, library expansion, community center, and um, really something that would be more of a locals kind of um, property. Something that, w that wasn't just one specific use, wasn't just housing, wasn't just um, a hotel, it wasn't just commercial, it was a mixture of everything. And that's what we came up with. And I don't know how much you guys have read through the portfolio that w we put together at the end of that process, but it encapsulates the entire entirety of what we went through in that process and really I'm not here to I'm here to sort of answer questions you guys might have about the process I don't want to speak any more about it unless you guys have specific questions uh, didn't you have a, a a paid advisory group to help facilitate this we did we had a group called MIG help uh, facilitate the process and how much did you think we spent on that it was a component of the the the, the, the greater general plan update process. So I don't know what the breakdown was just for Adam Street alone. I guess probably twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That's all. Yeah. Oh. Okay. That was ten years ago. I will say that you know. It, Outside of the Adam Street process, one thing that we did have, I don't know if any of you participated, um, Pat, I think you did, was when we had the mediated uh, town hall workshop for, at the at the uh, elementary school with... Well, I, I, I participated in both, but I think Suzanne was actually on the committee, weren't you? Sorry. Um, yes, I remember this whole process. Um, and no, I guess not. I'm mistaken. Pardon me. You're not in here. I'm not. No. I believe Suzanne was part there. of the pre. I the was part of the pre. Correct. Right. right. Um, I was there for discussion and all of the layout and all that. But I wasn't on the committee. What can I provide that would be helpful to you guys at this point? Uh, you know, for me, I, I wasn't there, but I, I remember uh, seeing a list of a lot of influential heavyweights in this town being a part of that group, and some went on become city council people, et cetera. And so uh, there were a lot of uh, active citizens in, in part of that group, and then I, I saw a lot of photographs, a lot of workshops, a lot of pie charts, and a lot of, a lot of hours went into this thing. And I was always under, trying to understand the genesis of it. I mean, was it to, was it put together because oh, here's a piece of land, and what can we do with it? Uh, uh, exactly, what prompted it, the idea that um, who who kind of got the ball rolling, or well, how did the ball get rolling that you know this was going to develop into the three concepts? So, the, so again, the idea was that since we were, in, you know, starting this whole general plan update process, we'd have a committee in place that was focused on thinking about the the community comprehensively. We'd also have consultants that would bring to the table the most recent sort of land planning and and outreach facility, you know, experience to the table, where we could all have a sort of facilitated discussion about. The community in general, and because of that, I think the council thought it would be a great time to revisit Adam Street, given the fact that the previous effort, um, when this the city had actually put out an RFP for projects, received quite a few, and actually ended up having dialogues with potential developers. Um, it, 
and then for some reason, this was before my tenure, uh, the decision was to put the project on hold and wait until the general plan update was happening because the council at the time knew that that was imminent. And that's why when we did finally start the general plan update process, this Adam Street project was added to the mix of, you know, a, sort of a dual track effort with the general plan update itself. If <clears throat> I, I, I think my memory on this is still reasonably decent. Um, if you recall, the original acquisition of Adam Street was to preclude Safeway from building on the Adam Street property. And because there was a real outcry in town that we didn't want another big, large commercial development and a footprint of huge parking space. And so the city stepped in and said, well, let's buy it. And we'll figure out how to, we can have this benefit the community in the future and have it focused on the community. The RFPs that went out prior to the 2009, which I can't remember exactly when all that happened, but there wasn't any community outreach and they just went ahead and put out RFPs and you got all these economic development experts that came along and said, hey, this is a gold mine, let's do this. And that wasn't at all what anyone wanted to do. And then, then the, the general plan update came along and we said, well, back off. And then we, I think they had learned pretty much from the lesson of not having any community engagement that then they engaged the community to come up with the 2000, what became the 2009 vision. And so that's how this came about. It kind of went through all those steps before. It would have been nice if we had engaged earlier. But, and it was a little bit of a fast track to buy the property because they were trying to, to deal with zoning issues, you know, and, and a whole host of things. But again, and I, there probably is a lot of community frustration right now that we haven't done anything with, with the property to benefit the community in, in general, sort of along the lines of the 2009 vision statement. But that's kind of how it got to this point. You, you are absolutely correct. Well, actu actually, um, the thought occurred to me yesterday that why did the city buy that in the first place? So I, so I spoke to an ex-mayor who can't remember. Um, I think he wasn't involved then, but I spoke to uh, the person who was the city manager at that time. And I sent an email uh, asking for input into why did the city ever buy that piece of property. Uh, I said, I hear rumors about town that the city bought that property to prevent uh, a large Safeway store from being built. I was assured that was not the reason. And that the decision was made uh, in a closed-door session, uh, but that this, the decision that was made in the closed-door session was then brought to the, uh, the entire city council. Um, and again, um, I thought about making a public records request, but I know how difficult that is. And after going through those buildings and seeing those stacks of cardboard boxes, I just it's hard for me to bring myself to do that. But, but I do think it would be interesting... Um, I mean, we could we could get to the approximate year, but that's that's about as close as we're going to get that that decision was made. But I was assured it was not because of Safeway. I I can remember how excited we all were <clears throat> after we got we went through all of this and it was decided and planned. It was included in the general plan, and had the general plan gone through, we wouldn't be here today I don't think um, but because it, it kept waiting the general plan wasn't approved and it wasn't approved and nothing could be done to that property until the general plan was approved and we still don't have it approved so here we are today I think you just answered my question Suzanne because I was wondering if the uh, results of the Adam Street proposal nine years ago were developed momentum and then lost steam um, it sounds like procedurally it was to be integrated somehow into the general plan and I, I don't know how that resonated out of the general plan or, or whether it was integrated somehow um, but um, it sounds like it's that that was a procedural issue it sounds like that to, to clarify it, it was never a part it's not directly linked to the general plan it yeah. it was a separate track that just it made a lot of sense to run them both together what happens with or doesn't happen 
with Adams Street is not directly related to the general plan update process. Yeah, I didn't mean it was necessarily part of it, but it sounds like that. I, I was just wondering how uh, that, why the general plan process took the steam out of the Adams Street project. I, I don't actually don't think it did. I, I think primarily, if again, maybe my memory is not serving me correctly, but I think town didn't think we had the financial capabilities of building it out. Right. Is why it sort of sat, mm -hmm. and then that again is I think why along came you know the idea that the RFP started going out I don't know a couple of years ago and oh here's what we can do we can sell the thing for twenty million dollars and fix all of our problems and make them all go away. So I, I think that if you go back back in two thousand nine we just didn't think we had the financial wherewithal to deal with it. I, I think for our purposes the um, the value of this report I mean there are specifically some good ideas and some things we may well draw on but the important thing here is that um, uh, when you talk to uh, it, you know we sort of we seem to have arrived with the city council at a point where it's either this 20 million dollar project or it's nothing and uh, th that seems to be sort of what the city council perceives from all the discussion that's gone on. But this report shows that if you engage the public and, uh, and bring forward ideas that they uh, participate in, uh, that there is a substantial opportunity for us to find middle ground. And I'm wondering from your perspective as you're working on this, how did that discussion go? Uh, you, you did formulate three proposals, but those came out of the discussion that you were having with various groups, I assume, and, uh, the and then there was dialogue to kind of get to number 2B or something like that. You're correct. I'll, the, basically, the, the core uh, of what came out of this process was all from directly from the community. From one, the first workshop we had, we showed up with basically blank maps of the Adam Street property and a bunch of post-its and pens and stars and other sort of stickers that people could put onto the maps so they could identify and draw on and write down everything that they wanted to see on the property. And basically what we did from that, and I think there was at least 40 folks who showed up and we broke out into, into the subgroups and just all sort of came up with our own little plans for them. And they all got back together and talked about them together. Out of all of that, we basically made lists of everything that was common and then based on how frequent all of the, if the, the community plaza was one of the highlights, having some open space in an amphitheater was another feature that people really wanted to see. Those are things that we developed into three different alternatives that staff and the consultants put together. And then we presented those to the second workshop, the community at the second workshop, and got feedback on those. From that work, the second workshop and those three alternatives is how we came up with the preferred alternative that's on the screen now. The thing that was exciting to me about that was that uh, of the three, uh, the one which was pretty close to a do-nothing and one that was pretty aggressive, uh, you came up with a, uh, a final proposal that was between the medium and the really aggressive. So uh, the community seemed really anxious to do some things that had positive community value. Correct. At least that was my takeaway from the report. What I was wondering, I went to the recent RFPs, the developer's presentation, and I was curious why we didn't see more of this visioning in their proposal. I didn't understand why the developers, or, or what the history was, why they didn't understand that if you were going to do something here, this is what the community needs to see. Like, there has to be some kind of low-income housing. There has to be some open space. You know, just some of those has to from what we've heard from the community. Well, you know, I think it's really, I'm glad that you brought that up because it was really strange. There, there were three responses to the RFP. Mm -hmm. The first two were discussed a lot because those two were the ones that were going to bring the city the most money. And they were basically a resort uh, a hotel on the entire mm -hmm. property. There was a third proposal, which didn't get much attention at all. Uh, and I'll admit very openly that the, uh, the person making that proposal is a close friend of mine. 
So I, I am rather biased toward his proposal, and I discussed it with him for a long time before he presented it. But he tried to model it as closely as possible right. after this this uh, net now the visioning process. And um, some people thought his proposal was too dense, and some people thought that his financing wasn't good enough. But it was never, ever really considered. And I guess when you get proposals, um, you can't go to one developer and say, we sort of like your plan, but would you consider making it less dense or, or would you consider uh, any modifications? Uh, I think that's uh, somebody like Mark or Mark or Greg will have to help me here, but I think it's illegal to do that. And it's too bad because uh, he would make modifications in his plan. To clarify that point, I think, and I'd have to look back at the RFP, but I believe the RFP, which was pr prepared by the city, um, strongly weighted applications that were generated, did, uh, that were designed to generate in, um, TOT. I could be wrong on that, but that no, it mentioned. I read this about three times. Uh, I'll, I'll read it again, and you read it again, but I don't think it's strongly weighted TOT. Yeah, the, the most, at least my opinion, the most recent RFP process that came out with the three, quote-unquote, hotel economic development proposals, I think those were when there was a pretty dark cloud hanging over the finances of the city and people really thinking we were you know, going in a very, very bad direction. And since then, we've got one new hotel at the north end of town, which appears to be doing better than they had originally anticipated. And we've got a half-cent sales tax. So, again, that happened then, and I, I guess it'll intersect part of what we're doing as it is or isn't appropriate, but um, that... There, there was a, a big rush to try and figure out how to create some revenue. Mm. Okay. I've got a quick comment. I'm touching on uh, what Anna said and um, a couple other comments. Um, the first agenda item was about um, communications, and we were talking about a lot of procedures and ideas that are um, very detailed. And then the next topic, of course, is the visioning around a specific parcel that was worked on nine eight years, eight years ago. I just wonder if we should step back at uh, on those points and with the shape committee being uh, put together and taking a look at such an overarching piece of the of the community, the, all the city facilities, whether we need to step it up and not kick it up a notch to the you know the word visioning is a good word that was in that report. Um, do we need to roll up what the committee is doing or, or could, could people comment on the idea of are we going to focus on process a lot and analytics or can we uh, add to that or, or have an overarching piece that is, addresses visioning or uh, the St. Helena brand, so to speak? Um, we have an opportunity here that's rare to... Um, get the community engaged and think about the St. Helena brand and what's the overarching, you know, what are some of the overarching visions, the shape committee and some of the other processes are, are process oriented, but getting communi community involvement might also be kicked up by um, generating some enthusiasm around a, a vision. Uh, we're talking a lot about process, and it's easy to get lost in the weeds, obviously. But maybe we're, there needs to be some kind of a, a brand, some excitement around branding. What's St. Lena all about as far as the, the, the community facilities? Uh, what can the community facilities vision um, direction be that would reflect the, the, the great character of the community? Um, just examples. I'm, over talking here, but um, I like the term visioning, uh, and that word was used, you know, in the report that was published some time ago. But I'm just, I guess, throwing it out to the committee. What are your thoughts about the concept of engaging the community and communicating the idea that there's a visioning process here that's at a 
an overarching level under which um, some of the solutions and mechanics and processes will be will be found uh, can, can I comment on that mark this may be taking us away from the agenda uh, a little bit but uh, you know, we have a, a city to the north of us that's going to have 970 hotel rooms, uh, including that massive thing they're building off the uh, off the trail. And we have the city of Napa that is building, or just about to finish, what four new hotels and and uh, uh, complete redevelopment of the downtown center and so forth. Uh, I think how Saint Helena positions itself is absolutely critical. And I uh, and to think that um, that we're just going to do more of what we've done in the past is, I think, a risky a risky approach. Anyway, that was just the thought I wanted to add to that. Um, well, I think you're you're right. I but I, I guess the the concept of what's Saint Helena and what's Saint Helena's attraction for continued you know economic well-being is something outside of what this group has been pulled together to do um, that said I think we are going to be coming up with a vision for what we think we should do with the facilities we have and the and what the facility needs are of the city so in that sense I think we will be be visioning things um, but as far as economic development and what's the future and how to deal with retail downtown and what visitors do we want to have coming here and that's that's for that's a whole nother issue and, and discussion I guess for me the takeaway on to bring this back to this agenda item for me I, I the process was a good process it was an engaging process I think people felt really good when it was done and the and and the the vision or the plan that came out of it and so my takeaway for that is we need to more or less replicate that and do that same thing and have that same community engagement in what we're doing here and and be able to present something and and get you know it, it's going to be a lot of work and again I've, I've said it a couple times tonight I mean we're just we're building the base to be able to start really having some pretty deep discussions and at some point in time we are going to be talking about every property and we're going to be sitting around here looking at the group going okay well what do you think should we should we sell the teen center and all the stuff on railroad should we do this should we do that I mean we're going to that's everybody's going to get to be able to say what they think what their grand plan for all the facilities and what should happen we are going to get to that point and that's I think that's going to be pretty exciting at that point in time I, I just wanted to follow up I, I agree I think that um, th that's going to be a great outcome taking a look at all the facilities um, uh, and I I'm just circling back to the idea that branding or a visioning at an ultra overarching level will drive the process and drive the uh, some of the um, suggestions about what's done with facilities um, I don't know if St. Lena has a slogan, but most of the towns around California have some kind of slogan. I know I'm getting off track a little bit, but I do think it's important that there be a vision or a slogan or a branding that drives, that's, that's overarching, that drives the procedures and the plans. And, you know, it's a touchstone to, to help make correct decisions, if you will, about some of the the details in the in the proposals about what's being done with the property how do they tie in and how do they drive and, and support the vision and the brand sometimes that makes things a little a little bit easier to make decisions about I don't know I'd like to know does what is the vision and the brand of St. Helena seen how is that seen in the community or outside to your point um, you know, Calistoga, they've got a slogan and, and they're, they seem to be rocking and rolling. Um, uh, any comments about that idea of having some kind of a, a vision or a slogan that, that overarches the mechanical pieces that we're looking at that can be pretty detailed? I'll, I'll say two things about that. Um, one, we actually used to have a slogan, which was St. Lena, Heart of the Napa Valley, and somehow that got 
taken away from us because um, maybe we didn't do any IP work on that. Um, but I think right now we do have we're called St. Lena Downtown Napa Valley or something. Our, we, we do have a slogan and we do have some branding and I think town and, and the Chamber of Commerce is, is working on that. Or Napa Valley's Main Street, I believe. Oh, Napa Valley's Main Street. That's um, what it is. And in, just in context of the focus of the committee, I, I would echo the chair's remarks regarding the focus. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as you trend tonight, of course, is we're acquainting you with a process that occurred in 2008, 2009, and uh, to familiarize yourself with that, that discussion. But um, at the end of the day, when, when you discuss the options that are available to you and you make recommendations related to the city's infrastructure assets, uh, it doesn't mean that the committee can't make additional, uh, can't share additional thoughts. And if branding happens to be one of those, then uh, it can find its way onto the final document. Um. Um, <clears throat> so much of this revolves around the word money. Uh, the 2009 plan was a, a beautiful plan. It was a beautiful vision. There was no, as you said, Mark, there was no money to, to finance it. I mean, I read through these documents over the last years, and I couldn't find anything that talked about paying for it. It kind of reminded me of looking at travel magazines and picking out all these resorts and and then never going because you couldn't afford the airfare. So um, the biggest problem I think we're, we're going to be faced uh, in this group is to believe in the potential facts that Adams, if it's true, could be sold for $20, 25000000 million up front in cash. And supposedly these hotel guys can generate $4 million in TOT, every year. If you put that over a 20-year time frame, you're talking $100 million plus. So you have to say to yourself, that's $100 million I got to be responsible for, whether I'm going to go for it and spend it to fix all the other things in St. Helena that could maybe use $100 million, like all the dilapidated buildings and make the parks better, and maybe we can shore up the library where we could have free tutoring for kids we could have really a community center somewhere else uh, you have to say to yourself we have 26 miles of roads uh, i go down a road that I, I practically lose the transmission by the time i get home on grayson and i went and looked on uh, caltrans what it was the cost to fix these roads with it it's 133 thousand dollars per lane mile just to maintain it and eight hundred thousand dollars per lane mile to fix a road that you've let go too far. Well, I think Grayson has gone too far. So if you take twenty-six miles of roads, which is actually fifty-two lane miles, times the uh, the average figure of five hundred thousand dollars, well, you could get up to fifty million dollars to fix all our roads. A new uh, city hall, ten million, five million for a police department, uh, historical society, museum, another five, ten million. I could get to 100 million easy. So you realize you got 100 million in potential needs and you got a 100 million dollar asset. This is the white elephant in the room. Um, I, oh. we're going to get there. We're going to have a long range financial forecast that'll tell us where we are and what monies we may have available and we're also going to have some folks that will come talk to us about alternatives for financing all these various things. Um, I one, uh, one thing that was told me a long time ago in business was you can, it doesn't always happen, but generally you can only sell it once. So you got to think long and hard before you sell it. And selling Adams Street um, is one way, I guess, to solve it, but I guess we'll see when we get some better information and then we know what, um, you know, EMG says properties are worth and what it's going to cost to fix properties and we'll, we'll start getting an idea. Uh, your $50 million number for the roads, though, I think is a bit off. If I recall, we've actually done a study in the last few years and I believe to bring all the roads up to a pretty high uh, whatever the standards are that they use, and extremely high, I think it was $12 million. So, 
Um, I think we need to be careful to not throw numbers out there that are a little exaggerated, maybe. Well, uh, maybe it's maybe it's 12 million, maybe it's 50 million, but it's not 1 million. And so uh, I think, I remember talking to Jennifer Phillips, she said, if you really want to know the numbers, I have to have a, a serious amount of money to do the analysis to get it right. So um, these are, I'm not here to, to, to advocate that it's 50 million for the roads, but I would say that there's a lot of roads that are disrepair and they've gone so far they're very expensive to repair them. And uh, it would be good to really know what that number is because I've talked to Peter White about the roads. He says they always underestimate what it's really going to cost to fix these roads. So I'm really curious to, to know what would it cost to get all these roads. And I, I think we're going to get some of those numbers. Yeah. But I, I think we also have a, a, a general idea because we, we, redid, we redid Charter Oak, which was probably actually, I mean, I know Grayson and South Crane are at the top of the list, but <laughs> Charter Oak so. was in pretty bad shape too. <laughs> in fact, when Jennifer Phillips got here and she said, oh, yeah, it's great. I, it, it, I see that you guys are already making progress to grind down Charter Oak. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's the shape of that road. So that was probably <laughs> the worst road in town. Um, and, you know, um, Erica could tell us and remind us, but I, I believe that thing came in under budget, and I maybe it was four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand. So I think we have some good information as to, and we will be able to get better information as to what infrastructure for the roads are. Our main focus is going to be buildings, and you can pencil that stuff out pretty. There's there's standard formulas to come up with what would it cost to build a you know, I don't know, on a square foot basis, a city hall. I mean, we, we'll, we'll be able to get there. But I, I, I wasn't finished with the laundry list. I mean, also the wastewater and uh, That's everything That's a separate else. enterprise. Right, but, but in general. part of the general plan and, and these monies, and you can't, you can't sell Adam Street and use Adam Street money to, to, to fix the wastewater and water, and, and that plan has already been developed, and I, it may be lacking a little bit in how many feet of main lines we're replacing a year, but that's a separate thing. We can't use any of the monies from these properties for that. Is the sale of, uh, excuse me, Oliver, is, is the sale of Adams Street um, back on the table or totally off the table? Or what's I think the we're story? way ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> way ahead of ourselves. Well, to we don't even, we haven't even seen a financial forecast. We don't know what it's going to cost. We, 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 we need to we need to go through the pro there, we have to follow a process and we have to stay on the mission that the city council has asked us to follow so well part of my question had to do with um, whether uh, we're, we're the main agenda item was the Adam Street property it was to review the vision of 2009 and the, and the process associated with how we ended up coalescing a great majority of the city around a vision for that property. That's, that's what we were talking about, not the specific what we were, we were going to do with Adam Street and whether that's still appropriate or not appropriate. That wasn't the point of the agenda item. It was to review how we got there and how that intersects with the community engagement that we're going to be doing as it relates to this group and and for the facilities. That's that, what that was about. Thanks for clarifying that. I, I think that um, it sounds like the and that that's a great tie into the first topic. The it's it sounds like the Adam Street visioning project, which is um, quite a ways back in history, is the purpose of bringing that up on the agenda. Is and I was I get I totally I guess I misunderstood. Um, it was an example of how community engagement can or cannot be effective, um, and uh, it also uh, brings up the idea of having some kind of a, a visioning concept, um, but it's not really on the table as a um, as a as an asset. I think um, those are great points, but I think um, the visioning process is actually more of a tool that is still relevant and still can be leveraged by the city as it moves forward. It's not a prescriptive document that talks about what should be done. done. It talks about what could be done and, and a process by which you can come up with some of those, making those decisions. And also identify some of the key features that the community w was interested in and probably still are interested in on the site. I'm sure there's, you know, maybe where everything ranks is differently now, but 
it's a document that I, that I that I encourage you to leverage. It's still relevant. To that point, was there a, a branding discussion vis-a-vis uh, -vis the um, Adam Street proposal back in 2009, uh, or was it more of a, a parcel-focused consultant report? Was there any overarching discussion of how that would reflect the St. Helena brand no. um, at the point at that time? It was a vision that we had that we would like to see there. That, as, as far as I remember, it was just our vision of what we wanted to see there, not not anything else, just our vision that we worked on. And I think um, I'm so looking forward to the financials to come in because then I think we'll have big discussions with the public when we can start talking about what we can do with our buildings and, and what needs to be done. And, and we don't have to rush really now to sell off Adam Street right away and get all I, and I know where what you mean about what we can do with that money but we don't have to be too quick about it I think we have we have time to to go a little slower and really vision what we want to do with everything and on, I mean again we we, we don't right. know if the the question of whether we need to sell Adam Street or not sell Adam Street is way far ahead of the discussion because we don't have the long-term financial forecast. It, it's, I mean, we, we're all talking in the dark. Well, to Oliver's it, point, uh, uh, I think that the um, Grayson and the condition of the roads is a piece of the, the branding problem, if you will. Um, go outside of the city and listen to what people say about the brand of St. Helena. Um, can we play a part or can we have some kind of a branding concept or a, a committee slogan or a project slogan, if you will, or a, a vision or a brand of what the city is all about that will help drive what we're doing at the process level or at the individual facilities level? Um, that, that's something that I think is important to talk about up front rather than have it be a footnote in our final report about branding is important. The branding, in, frankly, is inconsistent with the direction of the council. So the council is looking for feedback, recommendations, ideas, options uh, related to civic assets that have deteriorated. And so, again, while it's not, branding is not um, a part of the scope. It does not mean that the committee, when you're finished with the primary focus, can't add additional thoughts on a variety of issues, including uh, branding, which could be, it, which is a bit unrelated to fixing the civic assets. But uh, if there's something like that that you see is relevant to communicate to the council, uh, the committee can certainly do that. So, so since again, we're discussing it, could I just say a couple words about it? Because I really like Stan's idea. I think it's very exciting, and I'd love to talk about it a lot. But you're right, Mark, uh, and, and I won't go too far afield. But we have a Napa to the south of us, and they have a rock and roll concert uh, every summer. We have Calistoga to the north of us, and they're kind of the Wild West town. And I'd love to see St. Helena be the city of culture. And I would love to see that be our brand. And I would love to see us have, <clears throat> sort of like they have in Ashland, I'd love to see us have a small Shakespeare uh, festival here. And we have a number of people in town who are interested in, in Shakespeare. We've had the Globe Theater Company come to Napa Valley three times, and that's really a huge accomplishment. Um, we and I like to go to a chamber music series down in Napa, and they have to do it in the Methodist Church. And if we were a city of culture, we would be hosting chamber music in St. Helena, and we would have a historical society museum, uh, which goes right in with with the culture of music and the arts. And that's what I would like to see us be, and it's different. Thanks, Pat. I I think that it's important in my opinion, to touch on branding as or ad branding as a topic for the committee to, to kick around and include in a report perhaps. But 
Um, it drives revenue. Um, I think that when we get into the details of the properties, we can come up with a, a few options uh, and also uh, reflecting the, the consultant's report perhaps, but to come up with a plan that's, that's uh, net neutral as far as revenue. Of course, in, into Oliver's point, that's, and we looked at the financials last week, um, revenue of course is, is critical. And a lot of what we're talking about is going to be um, very revenue oriented, of course. Um, at a high level, I think that the facilities results or, or options could have a net neutral effect as far as revenue and ongoing cash flow. Uh, and underneath that, or above that, I think that the, the branding and what is St. Lean, all of it, that's, I think that's a great idea. I think the you know, city of culture, it's different than than Main Street. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of circling back too much here, but I, I just think that that's more important than just mentioning it as a footnote in our final report. Everybody's going to have an, everybody in the committee is going to have an opportunity to suggest what facilities they think town needs to have for civic purposes that it doesn't have today. So if when we get to that point, you want to suggest building out some community amphitheater or whatever it is, you'll be able to throw that out on the table. At the same time, you'll have to say, how are we paying for it? And then we'll have to find out if the community is supportive of that. Because at the end of the day, we are here for the community, which that community includes business people from downtown. It includes all sorts of cross sections of folks, but again, we have to be doing what the, the citizens and, the, and, and the, 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 the property owners and the voters of St. Helena want. We can't go off and just come up with our own vision that isn't consistent at all with what people want this town to be. Yeah, I'm thinking about how to say it, but... Um I was just thinking that, you know, making St. Helena beautiful or keeping St. Helena beautiful and keeping the facilities, bringing them up to a level of having the library not have chairs, that the upholstery is coming apart, or City Hall looks how City Hall looks, or the police department, all of that impacts the brand. So that's the tie-in that I think of what we're doing. But the brand, the brand drives the plan, and it can drive revenue. Okay, um, anybody have anything else to say on this agenda topic? Greg, thank you. You're welcome. Happy to participate anytime. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I, there's not anybody out in the public, so there probably aren't any public comments that anyone wants to make. Um, do we need to talk about the next meeting's agenda? So our next meeting will be held on December 13th at 6.30, and I don't have it in front of me. Um, We're going to go over the health diagnostic, right? We will. We'll have April back. Uh, she'll be back here with our CPA, also named Mark, um, who'll be going over the, the um, di municipal health diagnostic tool with us. And then we will also have a representative of EMG, which is our facilities assessment consultant um, here to kind of explain overall what you'll be getting from that report in in probably late January so they'll be providing um, a nice PowerPoint so that you can see what you'll be getting and what you'll be making decisions on okay great anything else for the good of the order okay I guess the meetings adjourned <laughs>